Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, unimaginable loss. One million Americans have now died of COVID. That number becoming a reality more than two years after the first COVID death in the U.S. How we got here and what doctors are learning about this current wave as COVID cases climb in dozens of states. What happens next as Americans react to the potential overturn of Roe versus Wade? Higher fencing goes up around the Supreme Court as Washington braces for more protests. How lawmakers are gearing up for the final ruling and the impact this could have on the midterm elections. Battle for Mariupol. Russia announces a ceasefire in the besieged city, allowing people to escape. This comes after the Ukrainian military says it's facing, quote, difficult, bloody battles there. The latest on the fight to save the city and the people who are trapped in some. And surfs up the lives on competitive surfers on display in a new documentary. We're going to introduce you to one of the pros profiled, how she dealt with training during the pandemic to make history on the water. Very cool. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Maybe not this weekend because of all the rain, yeah. but... <laughs> also, just not for me, period. It's, it's terrifying. There's that, yeah. too. All right. More on that in a little bit. We're going to begin this hour with that devastating milestone now surpassed in the fight against COVID-19. Yeah, more than one million people have now died from COVID here in the U.S. It's a figure that underscores the toll the pandemic has had on families and frontline workers across the country. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now with more on this. Hey, Gabe, good morning. Hi, Savannah and Joe. Good morning. You know, I remember when we interviewed a White House official back in March of 2020 who said that if we did everything right, we could expect anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 COVID deaths. Well, now here we are, one million and counting. It's perhaps the grimmest milestone of the pandemic. At least one million COVID deaths in the U.S., according to an official NBC News count. That number is devastating. But in the modern context, a million deaths in a very advanced country is unthinkable. Dr. Umesh Gidwani with Mount Sinai Hospital was on the front lines in New York City, one of the earliest epicenters of the pandemic. It's very hard to lose a patient that you've been fighting for. His cardiac ICU was converted into a full-time COVID unit. Back in March of 2020, what was the worst case scenario back then? When we started off, we were completely unaware. We were mm -hmm. caught unawares and we were not very clear about where this was go. Dr. Angela Chen diagnosed the first confirmed COVID case in New York. What I replay and recount is, you know, the patients that I've encountered with COVID and, and kind of being with them in their final days. Here in New York, new COVID hospitalizations are on the rise again, topping 2,000 for the first time since late February. There are also concerns of a possible fifth or sixth wave in some parts of the country. California cases are up 10 percent over the last week. But one million is much more than just a number for so many Americans. Lisa Wilson in Palm Beach County, Florida, lost her grandmother, Lily May, to COVID last summer. It was so terrifying. Um, my aunt called me one Sunday morning, I think, and, and she said something is wrong with her. She was uh, laid across the bed and she was like gasping for air. She was gasping for air. In all, six relatives claimed by COVID. It was very, very hard. Um, everyone was just confused about the whole situation. And we love you. It was just so heartbreaking. And she says that all six of her relatives who died were unvaccinated. And for some context, to give you some perspective on just how big that number one million is, it's about double the population of the city of Atlanta. And for some more perspective, Savannah and Joe, the 1918 flu pandemic killed about 675,000 people here in the U.S., obviously making COVID-19 by far the deadliest pandemic in American history. Back to you. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much. Let's bring in Dr. Bio Curry Winchell for more on this. She is the regional clinical director of Carbon Health. Doctor, good to have you with us. So that number, one million deaths from COVID, it's still something that's hard to comprehend. What do you think that number says about how the U.S. has handled this pandemic since the start and even now? 
Good morning. So, you know, as you mentioned, that number is so alarming and we really have to take note of where we were and where we are now. And it really shows that we have learned a lot. We now have vaccinations, which is a wonderful gift to really protect the entire nation. So I'm hopeful that at least now we have a way to continue to protect ourselves, but still remind ourselves of where we were before is so important. Doctor, we're now dealing with several variants of the original coronavirus that swept across the country in 2020, including this new strain of Omicron and the subvariants that that come from that. What do you say to people who are worried that we continue to see this virus mutating and what's the best advice for people to stay safe? So the best thing, because we know viruses tend to mutate, the one thing that you can do is get vaccinated, get boosted if you are eligible, because that's gonna be the way to really help protect yourself and your family. So we have the opportunity to really protect ourselves now. And so when you see these new variants, really take in the opportunity to protect yourself because it's now available. We've been reporting on so many of these milestones since this started two years ago. What can we do to make sure that we don't keep hitting any more milestones, especially when it comes to deaths? really take note of what is happening, you know, across different states in the nation. And so when we see an uptick in cases, we can really rely on what we know really helps, such as wearing a mask, get boosted, get vaccinated. All of those things are things that we have in our toolbook to really help protect ourselves. So really lean in on that. And that's going to really help you overall protect, you know, yourself and your family. Good advice, Dr. Bio Curry Winchell. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. And NBC News is creating a collection of images that represent those who we've lost to the virus. If you have a loved one or someone important to you who died because of COVID-19, you can upload a special photo of them or any image that represents a memory of the time you shared together. To find out more, you can go to the address at the bottom of your screen. It's NBCNews.com slash COVID collections. Now for the latest political fallout over that leaked draft opinion, suggesting the Supreme Court is poised to overturn Roe versus Wade, a decision that would have sweeping consequences for millions of Americans on both sides of the abortion debate. NBC's chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander has the latest. Good morning. That explosive leaked draft opinion has ignited emotions across this country, sparking new security concerns, leading law enforcement to fortify the perimeter outside the Supreme Court with a new eight foot fence, just like the one put up following the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Overnight, this new non-scalable fencing being installed around the Supreme Court right. after heated clashes in recent days on the steps of the court and nationwide between Americans on both sides of the abortion battle. My body, my choice. Crow, life is crow, woman. The question this morning, what happens next if the Supreme Court follows through on its leaked draft opinion that overturns Roe v. Wade? President Biden slamming the draft. This is about a lot more than abortion. Warning the conservative court could unravel other privacy rights like same-sex marriage and contraception and taking aim at former President Trump's MAGA movement. Because this MAGA crowd is really the most extreme political ex organization that's existed in American history, in recent American history. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi slamming the draft as an assault on women. Did violence not only to women, but to the Constitution of the United States. But Republicans like Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida are taking a wait-and-see approach, largely focusing on the leak. You know, you can leak stuff out of a court, which was really unprecedented, uh, but let's see when you actually have something rendered. Overturning Roe would not outlaw abortion, but would leave it up to state legislatures to decide whether there should be restrictions. North Dakota is among the 13 states with so-called trigger laws that would ban abortion with exceptions for the health of the mother if Roe is overturned. It means lights out in North Dakota. Abortion rights opponents say it will be the moment they've worked toward for 50 years. It looks like we may have an opportunity to build consensus and pass laws to save lives all over the country. It's already heating up as a crucial issue heading into this fall's midterms with Democrats looking to capitalize, but Republicans insisting it won't matter in November. We're going to win in 2022 uh, and Roe v. Roe v. Wade is not going to change the outcome. 
Senate Democrats right now are on track to hold a vote next week that would guarantee abortion rights nationwide, even though they don't have the votes and it's doomed to fail. But their goal here is to force every senator to put their position on this issue on the record. Back to you. Thank you, Peter Alexander. Now, Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski said Wednesday she will look at the legislation Democrats are working on, but she noted that when the Senate voted to proceed to the bill earlier this year, she opposed it. Now, as expected, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates by half a percentage point yesterday. The biggest hike in 22 years is aimed at reining in sky-high inflation and bringing down prices for both consumers and businesses. So how will this impact your bottom line financially? Well, NBC News business and technology correspondent Jolene Kent is here with some answers for you. Hey, Joe, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. This is the most aggressive step we've seen by the Fed to try to fight inflation and bring down those super high prices that we've been seeing everywhere. And it's one of several actions from the federal government in its attempt to get some relief to families and small businesses who are struggling to make ends meet. This morning, the price of borrowing money is going up again to help bring everyday prices down. We need to do everything we can to restore stable prices. We'll do it as quickly and effectively as we can. On Wednesday, the Federal Reserve raised the interest rate by half a percentage point, the biggest hike in 22 years. The increase makes borrowing money more expensive, from new mortgages to auto loans to credit card rates. It's designed to cool down consumer demand and curb inflation, now at a 40-year high. President Biden trying to address the problem, too, vowing to cut the federal deficit by another $1.5 trillion this year. We reduce federal borrowing and uh, we help combat inflation. Meanwhile, the new rate hike is a mixed bag for small businesses hoping to expand. Nearly a third say they're dealing with inflation by borrowing money on a regular basis. In Oklahoma City, Jeff Reagan's family business makes energy bars. But with rates going up, he says it's harder to get affordable loans to buy equipment and boost production. It puts just even more pressure uh, to not only try and thrive, which is our goal, but really just to survive. In Chicago, restaurant owner Terry Evans welcomes anything that lowers inflation after surging costs forced her to raise menu prices. But now she worries higher rates may cause her customers to cut back even more on dining out. It does present cause and concern for me that our business could potentially start to dip based on the fact that people are going to have to change their buying habits. Experts say with the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict and supply chain issues out of China with COVID there, don't expect your food or energy prices to come down anytime soon. And as for the R word, recession fears, Fed Chair Powell says there's nothing to suggest we're close to that with unemployment so low right now. And he also ruled out raising rates more than half a point at a time for mm. now. And that actually sent the stock market soaring. And no doubt, Savannah, that the Fed will be watching tomorrow's jobs report for April very, very closely. Absolutely. We all will. We know you will be. Jolene, thank you. Now let's get a check on your morning news now weather, which means that Michelle Grossman is back this hour. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, Savannah. And we are looking at a busy day once again in terms of sphere weather. We're going to see that today, also Friday into Saturday. So let's talk about today's forecast. A nice day in the Northeast. It was wet yesterday. You need the umbrella, but we're looking good today. The cold front that brought that wet weather is well off the coast in the middle of the country. Once again, uh, from Texas all the way to Kentucky, we are looking at severe weather. Again, we could see some tornadoes, certainly some hail and also some heavy rain. Uh, winds and some really gusty uh heavy rain and some gusty winds. Off to the west, we are looking at another system making its way on shore, so we're going to see a wet west for a while. So as we look at the flood threat in the red, that's your flash flood warning. That's the most dangerous weather scenario. So we're going to be watching that throughout the day. The ground is very saturated. We're seeing rainfall ra rates of two inches per hour. So that's something we're definitely going to watch as we Looking at uh, the wet weather now shifting to the east from the Gulf Coast all the way to the Ohio Valley into uh, parts of the northeast. It's going to be wet where you see the yellow. That's where we're seeing the heaviest rain. Again, we do have the threat for severe weather here. So gusty winds, heavy rain, and also some hail, even a few tornadoes. We'll watch that on Friday. 
in the middle of the country, it's going to be hot, feeling like summer in many spots. Notice southern Texas near 100 degrees in some spots and rain and snow in the Pacific Northwest. Saturday, unfortunately, we start out the weekend with lingering rain in the mid-Atlantic, the northeast as well. So you need your umbrella. We could see up to a half of an inch of rain in some spots. So if you have things to do indoors, you might want to do it that day because Sunday looking much, much better. Summer heat continues in the middle of the country. We do have rain in the northern plains or at least parts of the northern plains and that mountain snow is continuing. As we look towards Mother's Day, a bright day in the northeast and really all up and down the east coast. We're looking at some rain along the Great Lakes, the upper Midwest, and mountain snow continuing. The fire weather danger does continue today, tomorrow, also on Saturday into Sunday. There's a big difference in terms of temperatures. We have that jet stream kind of dividing the nation between the warm versus cold. So, Chicago, you've been below average all week long, but changes are coming, I promise. Ahead of this cold front, we are looking at uh, Atlanta 89 degrees today. That's 12 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Then as we go throughout tomorrow, Philadelphia, it's cool. We're about seven degrees below normal for this time of year. And we'll end it by just looking at the better news in Chicago. Uh, by Monday, we're looking at 81 degrees. That's a big difference. Savannah? Wow. Ending it on better news. I yes. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Sure. See you in a bit. And coming up, heavy fighting intensifies in Ukraine overnight, especially in Mariupol. The latest on the ground in Ukraine next. But we're getting a better idea of the toll of this war and how Ukrainian fighters are trying to hold up against the Russians. Welcome back in Ukraine this morning. There are mixed messages coming out of that blockaded steel plant in Mariupol. Russia announced a three-day ceasefire there in order to allow civilians to evacuate, but Ukrainian officials say fighting is continuing. That all comes as more American-supplied weapons arrive in the country. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin is with us from Kyiv. Hey there, Joe and Savannah. A senior U.S. defense official says Russia's progress on the battlefield has been slow and uneven. This says more and more Western weapons have been arriving here in Ukraine every day. This morning, American supplied howitzers are now a part of the fight in Ukraine. A senior U.S. defense official telling NBC News 90 percent of the howitzers promised are now in Ukrainian hands, with some already being used on the battlefield. The flow into the region continues um, at an incredible pace. A U.S. congressman also telling NBC News Ukraine is now asking the Biden administration for anti-ship missiles to free up vital ports along the Black Sea. This despite a fresh warning from the Russian defense minister that any movement of NATO weapons inside Ukraine is considered a legitimate target. Russian forces have been attacking transportation hubs, although those strikes have had no appreciable impact on Ukraine's ability to resupply itself, according to a senior U.S. defense official. And this morning, the New York Times reported reports the U.S. has provided intelligence that helped the Ukrainians target and kill Russian generals, according to unnamed senior American officials, although the sources declined to say how many generals had been killed as a result of that assistance. NBC has not independently verified those claims, and a National Security Council spokeswoman told the Times in a statement that the battlefield intelligence was not provided to the Ukrainians with the intent to kill Russian generals. It comes as fighting rages on at the besieged steel plant in Mariupol, the last Ukrainian stronghold of the devastated port city. Despite this week's harrowing rescue mission, hundreds of civilians and fighters are still trapped inside. We counted the minutes between each bombing, five minutes, ten minutes, this survivor says. We expected to die any minute. An investigation by the Associated Press now estimates 600 civilians died on March 16th when the Russians bombed the Mariupol theater. The new death toll doubled the original Ukrainian government estimate and the product of a detailed analysis of what happened. With Russian forces now in control of most of Mariupol, there's no way to know for sure and no way to honor the dead inside the city. With respect to that report about the United States providing Ukraine with intelligence, the New York Times also reporting, citing officials that the United States is not providing Ukraine with intelligence with respect to Russia's most senior leaders. This morning, the Kremlin spokesperson was asked about that New York Times report and replied, quote, the Russian military is doing everything that is necessary in this situation. Joe and Savannah. All right, Aaron McLaughlin, thank you so much. And now for more on Ukraine, we're joined by Jason Beardsley. He's the National Executive Director at the Association of the U.S. Navy. Jason, good to have you with us as always. So first, let's just talk about Mariupol. Is there a chance we're nearing the end game there with this latest bout of fighting? Do you think Russia will entirely capture the city, especially keeping in mind that Russia had essentially set a deadline of what's called Victory Day. That's this holiday, it's May 9th, just a few days away. 
Yeah, that, that has been their intent, and boy, they've been at this for a long time. The siege for Mariupol has bled out the Russian resources. Uh, their battalion tactical groups have been eviscerated. They may actually control the terrain at the end of this, and the Azov steel uh, plant is not clear yet. We don't have information yet that they've cleared it. That's a very difficult fight in urban terrain, so I think the Russians are probably a little bit uh, reluctant to go in, and when they do, they're going to handle, uh, they're going to deal with more casualties. So, at the end of this, they'll have some nominal control, but it's really been bleeding out the Russians, and right now the Russians are trying to focus on the upper sort of um, eastern area around Izium and, uh, you know, uh, Krematorsk, but they are going to have a difficult time now recovering. Making a celebration on, on May 9th mm. uh, for them is a real face-saving maneuver. It's going to be a farce, but uh, I do see them as uh, largely controlling the terrain now. Jason, I want to ask you about that New York Times article that Erin mentioned just a moment ago in her report, and there's some back and forth here. So just to recap, it says, American intelligence has actually been helping Ukraine, quote, kill Russian generals, citing unnamed U.S. officials. The report says the information has been critical in the deaths of some generals. Now, the National Security Council released a statement after that, after the article was published, saying the intelligence was not provided, quote, with the intent to kill Russian generals. And in your opinion, and what do you make of this back and forth? Is there concern here that it could escalate tensions with Russia? Well, you know, I think the tensions with Russia are at maximal right now. I think this is very sloppy. Uh, I've been saying for a while it is likely that Western intelligence has been passed downgraded to the Ukrainians because otherwise we wouldn't see these very effective, precise strikes. The difference between me saying it and a source from the National Security Council going out and publishing this, uh, that's a shame. It's not the best way to do intelligence. And it reminds me that this administration sometimes is a little bit more celebratory on their successes in the intel realm when they're really kind of um, tilting their hand a little too much. You know, on the front side of this, we were told for six months that this invasion would happen. Meanwhile, we didn't put weapons on the ground in front of the invasion. We waited till three and four weeks into it. Now we're flowing them behind time, trying to get weapons in during a hot war that's very difficult. So I'm not a, a real fan of seeing this published in the New York Times. It doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Now, Jason, I do want to ask you about something concerning. Yesterday, Russia's defense ministry said it practiced simulated nuclear capable missile strikes in the western enclave of Kaliningrad. Is Russia sending a message here and quickly particularly mention this backdrop of Sweden and Finland considering an application to join NATO? Yeah, Russia really messed up. Uh, you know, what they wanted to do was make sure NATO didn't expand and they wanted to capture Ukraine. On the other hand, what's going to happen now is NATO is going to expand. They are saber-rattling by talking about their nuclear arsenal. They've done this before, mm -hmm. and it's part of their attempt to try to scare off the West. But really, I think that's more saber-rattling than ever, anything. We've seen the propaganda minister in, on vacation in Dubai, and we know the Russian arsenal of nuclear weapons is not going to be maintained any better than their in-service trucks and their infantry that we're seeing hammered and depleted in Ukraine. So I think they've got other problems that are uh, underneath the surface that they mm. don't want to talk about. So I do consider this some heavy saber rattling. That being said, it's never, it's always dangerous when you're dealing with proxy wars right. uh, with armed nuclear conflict at the, uh, you know, the outset of that. So uh, we, we, we should be careful. It's another reason why that Intel report in the New York Times was not good. Yeah, Jason Beardsley with some important context and analysis there. Thank you so much. And coming up, we're learning more about the attack on comedian Dave Chappelle at one of his shows. New video shows the moments the suspect was captured. The details we're learning about the man from his own family members. And on the run, the manhunt for an accused killer and the corrections officers police say helped him escape has now been underway for nearly a week. What investigators are now learning about the relationship the two had when the inmate was behind bars. Those details are next. We have new details this morning about that shocking attack on Dave Chappelle. The comedian released a brief statement about the onstage altercation. While the suspect is being held on bail, is facing assault charges. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz has the very latest. Gotti, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. Yeah, a lot of people are asking how that suspect, 23-year-old Isaiah Lee, was able to smuggle a weapon past security and past metal detectors at L.A.'s iconic Hollywood Bowl. Authorities so far have not released a motive, but the suspect brother tells Rolling Stone Lee suffers from mental health issues. Make some noise for hip-hop history. 
Just seconds after being attacked by a member of the audience, Dave Chappelle was back on his feet and back to making jokes. Thank God that was clumsy. In eyewitness video obtained by TMZ, the suspect can be seen surrounded by security. Chappelle's close friend Jamie Foxx also on stage. Whenever you're in trouble, Jamie Foxx will show up in a sheriff's hat. Comedian Tehran was also nearby as the suspect approached. If it wasn't for his clumsiness and Dave Chappelle's prowess, something worse could have happened. The suspect, 23-year-old Isaiah Lee, appeared bloody and bruised before being booked on suspicion of felony assault with a deadly weapon. He's back there getting stomped. <laughs> Police say Lee was carrying this replica gun with a bayonet-style blade. Hollywood Unit, suspect 2301 of Hollywood, Highland Avenue with Hollywood Bowl. The suspect's brother telling Rolling Stone Lee suffers from mental health issues and has been in and out of homeless shelters. Despite jokes later cracked on stage by Chris Rock and others, Was that Will Smith? Industry professionals say the attack shows the need for improved wow. security measures to protect performers. It's almost like a secret service kind of type of uh, awareness you might need to have because we've seen so many examples of how quickly things can escalate and how quickly somebody can get to the stage. The company that manages the Hollywood Bowl is saying in a statement, the safety of our artists, visitors, and staff is our top priority. While Netflix, which sponsored the comedy festival where the attack occurred, saying, we strongly defend the right of stand-up comedians to perform on stage without fear of violence. Confrontations like this 2018 incident at a comedy club in South Carolina have become more common in recent years, according to club owners and comedians like Tehran, who says the shared connections between performers and audiences needs to be preserved. This is a safe space not only for the comedians on stage, but for the audience as well. And it means everything for this to remain a safe space. Now, Chappelle's representative says the comedian wants his four-night run at the Bowl to be remembered for more than just one ugly incident, writing, The performances by Chappelle at the Hollywood Bowl were epic and record-breaking, and he refuses to allow last night's incident to overshadow the magic of this historic moment. All Joe? Right. Gotti Schwartz. Scotty, thank you. Now, the ongoing manhunt for an accused killer and a corrections officer who authorities believed helped him escape is now nearly a week old. This morning, NBC News has learned that deputy had been visiting the inmate behind bars for years. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Florence, Alabama, the last place their getaway car was seen. Hey, Sam, good morning. Savannah, good morning. A nation certainly captivated by this, a community deeply concerned. And we're now learning from law enforcement officials that Casey White had threatened to kill his ex-girlfriend and her sister in the events that he was able to get out of prison. Well, White has been serving now 75 years. That's the term for a series of violent crimes. He was only a few years into that. And now this manhunt pursuing a seventh day, a full week. This brief video of Vicki White and Casey White leaving an Alabama jail, the deputy holding the door for the convicted felon and accused murderer, belies an apparently lengthy relationship spanning years. He was here in 2020 for an arraignment and uh, preliminary hearing, and uh, he, when he finished that, he went back to state prison. Uh, we do know that they remained in touch while he was in state prison. So their relationship in whatever parameters you would define it is at least two years old? Yes maybe older. Could be older. The sheriff also says Vicki repeatedly drove more than two hours to this state prison outside Birmingham to see Casey, who he isn't sure how many times. The state telling us any logs or video of their visits aren't ready for release. It's the latest layer in a complex case. This could happen with the best of the folks. I mean, Vicki White, I would trust with my life. I mean, she's that kind of solid person. All attention now focused squarely on finding the unlikely pair on the run since last Friday. The U.S. Marshal Service posting these sketches to demonstrate the immense height differential between the six foot nine Casey White and the five five Vicky White. This new surveillance video from a gas station apparently shows the pair driving on a local road in a patrol car before ditching it in a parking lot and hopping in a Fort Edge getaway car. So far, no one has reported seeing them. Are you surprised no one noticed the six foot nine man walking out of the I car? I am surprised. And what about the cameras? He's a big guy. Authorities not only say Casey White could have changed his clothes and his appearance, which he's done before, but the duo may be heavily armed. She owned an AR-15, a shotgun, and another pistol. Uh, typically, those would not be in her patrol car. They were her personal weapons, as was the duty weapon she carried. Um, but 
I, I think the fact that she owns them, uh, I think it's a fair assumption that they're with them. The U.S. Marshal Service says that they have zero credible information as to where the two could be headed. A commander deputy who says he's been on this job for 20 plus years has never seen a case like this until now where they have nothing solid by way of information, guys. And it's also worth noting the sheriff's department here saying that Vicki White is no longer employed by them. We know that she was supposed to retire that last day, never got the paperwork actually in. It's not clear, though, if she's been fired. Back to you. All right, Sam Brock, thank you so much. Coming up, saving their town. People in one Tennessee community are taking on a major corporation and the state. Why? So they can keep control of their town. What's behind this fight to avoid a corporation from taking over their small community? Plus, avoiding burnout. A new study shows a majority of parents are feeling burned out right now. So what can be done to help working parents feeling stressed out? A doctor's advice next. Welcome back. New this morning, Elon Musk has secured more than $7 billion in new funding for his Twitter takeover. That co-founder Larry Ellison and a Saudi prince. The new commitments will help Musk to cut the margin loan he's taken to $6.25 billion from the $12.5 billion announced earlier. Last week, Twitter accepted a $44 billion bid from the Tesla CEO to buy the social media giant. Musk says he plans to take the site private. A small, predominantly black town in western Tennessee is fighting for survival after the state tried to take it over. Local leaders say the move was brought on by greed after Ford announced plans to build a massive plant in the community. The state says it's just trying to help the town after years of mismanagement. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson has the story. As far as the eye can see, a necessity for any major auto plant. But we're a long way from Detroit. Why Tennessee? We looked at 15, 20 different states, and this site that we're standing on really stood out um, above all others. Ford is among several major automakers looking to dominate the electric vehicle market, and they're setting up shop in the South to do it. Today we're announcing the largest investment in American manufacturing in the history of our company. That investment, an ambitious five $5.6 billion mega campus called Blue Oval City, where the electric version of America's most popular vehicle, the Ford F-150 truck, will be built. We needed a site that has the size, the flexibility, and the breadth of what we need in terms of the infrastructure. The electric battery plant requires five times the electricity that a normal assembly plant requires today. Volkswagen, General Motors, and Nissan all churning out cars in factories across the state. What impact do you think this will have in Western Tennessee? Uh, I think it's going to be transformational. I think it'll bring the next generation of jobs and tech jobs to this area. Already, Ford has begun recruiting local eighth graders. It's an amazing sight to see, though. You know, you see all these companies, big companies like Ford, here to give us an opportunity to see what our future can look like. Ford's Blue Oval City will be one of the largest U.S. auto plants ever. The 3,600 acre campus will cover nearly six square miles and employ about 6,000 people. With this expected boom, will come money. Lots of it. The more than $1 billion the state has already committed to the area to attract Ford, just the beginning, with the potential to send property values in towns near the plant soaring. Towns like Mason. The predominantly black town of around 1,100 people has a median household income of only $35,000 a year. The median home value, just under $90,000. I, mean, I think it's a good idea, you know, is bringing in new jobs and, you know, just something new for Tennessee because they definitely need it. I think it's going to be good for the community, you know, a lot of opportunities for a lot of people. Very excited about it. Can't wait. I'm excited because I want to, you know, see change. But just when the town of Mason thought hope was on the horizon... Citizens of one small West Tennessee town are fighting to keep their community under their control. It all started with a letter sent by the state comptroller to the town residents. We were blindsided. We had two options. One was to relinquish our charter. If we didn't, they would come in and take over the finances of the town. Giving up the charter would place the predominantly black and Democrat 
Democratic town in the hands of Tipton, the majority white and Republican-leaning county that Mason is part of. That means that no citizen that is now in Mason will have any say-so whatsoever. They will come in and do whatever they want to any of us, however they want to do us. For more than a century, Mason was run by white elected officials. That all changed in 2016 when almost all the town officials resigned amid fraud and mismanagement allegations. Now, all of Mason's leaders are black. He was determined to try to divide our city by causing the people to turn against the elected officials that they had placed in office. The comptroller says his office is only looking out for Mason's best interest, writing in that letter that the town has been poorly managed for at least 20 years, then highlighting opportunities that the new Ford plant could bring before adding, people and companies will not invest their money in a poorly run town. The comptroller denies race played any role. He declined to be interviewed on camera for this story, but a spokesperson tells NBC News that their office office has worked with Mason for years to pay down the roughly half a million dollars that was owed to the state when the letter was sent, adding, due to the fact that previous attempts at corrective action with the town were unsuccessful, the comptroller has taken the final step of enhanced financial supervision. The comptroller has said this isn't about race, there's no bias, he just wants to best position Mason uh, so that they can reap all the benefits when Blue Oval City comes. Yes. That's bull. These people laying here, the value is going to skyrocket. So yes, you want to take control of the land and the money that's coming down the line because you don't want us to have control of it. Last month, the NAACP got involved, suing the state to stop the financial takeover. When we looked across the state, cities and towns, that had had problems with their finances. They were never asked to give up their charter. We saw it as clear discriminatory practices. But a judge ruled the comptroller has broad authority over local government operations, including requiring state approval for any town expenses over $100, writing, the court recognizes the harsh realities imposed upon an administration that did not contribute to the financial burden of the town. But the court must also take into account the state's interest in moving the town towards financial stability and a balanced budget. If this debt is not paid off by the time Blue Oval is up and running, by the time those businesses and people do start coming, what then? Well, it's going to be paid. We're going to do it. I just believe God's going to make a way. Thanks to Priscilla Thompson for that report. The two sides have reached a preliminary agreement in which Mason will drop the lawsuit. The town used part of its American Rescue Plan funding to pay down. Hundred fifty thousand dollars they still owe. Now we've all felt the stress of the pandemic, but if you're a working parent, that's likely especially true, and you might feel overwhelmed and exhausted at this point. Well, you're not alone. A new study out this morning shows 66 percent of parents report feeling burned out right now. NBC News Now anchor Morgan Radford joins us with more. Hey, Morgan, good morning. Hey there, Savannah. Good to see you this morning. Look, that's why the authors of the study are now sounding the alarm, saying that we've reached epidemic levels of parental burnout and exhaustion. They're even calling it a major public health issue. And the researchers say this may just be the beginning, that we haven't even seen the full range of long-term effects that this burnout has had on parents and even kids. But the side effects, well, they're likely still hitting many families today. But there is some good news, Savannah. They've also shared some very recent real and practical ways to help. I'd say we do, you know, we feel a little burnt up. It's a daily struggle. Some days it's just total chaos. Playing out for parents nationwide. Had to do everything on top of your normal duties and then some. Parental burnout, feeling overwhelmed, overwork, and plain exhausted over long periods of time. A challenge Kate Golick knows firsthand. Okay, you can. As a working mother of four living near Columbus, Ohio, and a professor at the Ohio State University's College of Nursing. There was one point during the pandemic where I really felt like I was being forced to be the superhuman. I had to be an elementary school teacher. I had to be a caregiver. I had to be a spouse, a cook, a cleaner. I had to be emotional support for everyone. And it's not feasible for you to have to take on so many different roles. And it's inevitable almost that there's not some degree of burnout present. 
which is why she co-authored a new study just released today that found that out of more than 1,200 parents surveyed in the middle of the pandemic, 66% of them reported burnout, a phenomenon that was more common among women and in homes with two or more children. When we talk about burnout, how do you distinguish that from just a pretty rough day or being tired one day? Burnout in parents is that physical, emotional, over exhaustion and that feeling of just, I need a break. And I think it's very shaming for parents to think that they can be burned out in this role of being a parent, you know, because obviously we all love our kids and it's too much on us to be asked to do all of these different things. What happens as a society if we do not address this problem? I do feel like it's a public health problem. It's not that I'm depressed. It's not that I'm anxious. It's actually that I'm just burned out in this role. And it can manifest in harmful ways. In some cases, the research shows anxiety and increased alcohol consumption for parents, along with increased likelihood of insults or even physical harm through spanking aimed at children. As for the kids, parents experiencing burnout reported they saw more signs of unhappiness, more trouble concentrating, and increased difficulty interacting with other children. <laughs> The good news, says Dean Bernadette Melnick, who co-authored the study with Golic, is that there are also strategies that can help. Things like being kind to yourself and lowering expectations, asking for help, or talking to someone you trust, and self-care, even something as small as five-minute recovery breaks. For parents who are struggling with this feeling of burnout every single day, what can they do? Take two minutes, make a hot drink, sit, sip it slowly, focus on the present moment, count your blessings, not what you don't have. Just four to five abdominal deep breaths can so relieve stress. It's these types of simple practices that can make a big difference for anybody who's stressed. A tiny bit of advice for parents everywhere, taking it one step at a time. And check this out. Those researchers also included a really helpful self-check survey in their study. It's a 10-point checklist, and it basically lets you know where you are on a scale of 1 mm. to 10 when it comes to burnout. It also gives you really usable steps that you can take depending on where you are on that scale to really help you manage those feelings. And they also underscore that there is real courage in asking for help because they say simply, you cannot pour from an empty cup. Mm. Savannah? Wow, isn't that true? And that survey is very yeah. neat. It seems like a really good way to actually narrow down what you're going through. All right, Definitely. Morgan, thank you so much. Of course. Coming up, catching the biggest wave, we're getting a glimpse at what life is like for some of the world's professional surfers. One of them is actually joining us live. The history she's making for women in her sport. That's up next. Plus, Dolly is in, as we told you yesterday, despite initially trying to get her name out of the running for the... What she is saying about the honor, you're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. Get your pretzels and your hot sausages ready because NFL is heading to Germany. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers will face the Seattle Seahawks in Munich on November 13th, the fourth matchup in a series of five international NFL games scheduled for 2022. Now get this, NFL data showed that Germany has a strong football fan base, specifically for the Seahawks as the second most popular franchise in the country. And now between Buccaneers quarterback Tom Brady's return from retirement, of course, and the Seahawks losing longtime quarterback Russell Wilson, the game won't be one to miss. Now I want to know which the number one most popular I team know, right? in Germany. I know, right? How come they didn't get that? Hopefully. Sorry. The Seahawks are great. Yeah. They'll have a great time. All right. All right. A new documentary series on Apple TV Plus is going into the deep end, following some of the world's best surfers as they aim to become world champions. Yeah, it's called Make or Break, and it takes... Total wipeouts. These athletes put everything on the line and on their boards. Take a look. My job is professional surfer. The best job in the world. My goal is to win titles. That's what I'm here for. The world's best surfers in the world's best waves. Guys, if you're listening, we're lost. <laughs> this is the first time ever the women are at Pipeline. We have never been given an opportunity like that. We've had a shark attack. 
Whoa. It's the most intense surfing scenario you can imagine. He saw every bit of this. I have to step up my game now and not make any mistakes. And he goes for it. Oh my God. <laughs> this is a war. You have to find a way to win it and do it at all costs. <laughs> We're joined now by professional surfer Sage Erickson. She's one of the surfers featured in the docuseries that you just saw there. Um, also, apparently superhuman because I do not understand <laughs> how this is possible and how it's not just so scary to see the size of those waves and just head towards it. But Sage, thanks for being with us. So this is a pretty in-depth series on the realities of professional surfing. What was it like for you to be followed during competition? And what do you hope viewers take away from a series like this and kind of seeing behind the scenes of what you do? Yeah, well, good morning. You know, really, this is the first big insight on what it's like to be a professional surfer. You know, we sometimes are often looked at, we have these casual lifestyle and we mm. live by the beach and our toes are in the sand. And <laughs> this really shows the intensity of, of what each of us go through, um, performing under pressure, seeing what it's like to deal with relationships, um, the dramatic effects between us and other competitors. And just, I hope people, you know, become inspired that this is a true profession. Um, it's a beautiful one. It's hard. And that they just, you know, one day either hope to be a pro surfer or um, they love what we do and, and encourage an active lifestyle. I mean, it is hard to begin with. And then this was filmed in the middle of the pandemic during yeah. a time when really mental health and sports started to come more into the national spotlight. Mm, Surfing, point. not immune to either of those issues. How'd you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, especially with our tour starting off in Australia, you know, what I do and what we do is on an international platform. Um, so we entered a country really strict. Um, and the way we were allowed to do that was because we followed protocols. Um, we made sure that we protected ourselves and others. Mm -hmm. And we were out in the ocean um, somewhere that is really active. Um, and just, you know, prioritizing, doing what we love within the restraints that we knew um, was safest for us and, and who was around us. So, I mean, it was stressful for sure. I think we all felt that and we all connect um, on that point. And yeah, it just, uh, it worked out. We have world <laughs> champions and we have this amazing series. And so it just uh, couldn't have gone better. Yeah. Now, Sage, in the trailer there, we heard a little bit about some of the history that was made in this last season. You just touched on some of it. And for the first time, women were included in the pipeline competition on the famed North Shore of Oahu, which is just so amazing. But I know there were some scary events leading up to that. Walk us through that day and what it was like to be one of the first women to surf that championship tour event. Yeah, it brings back so many emotions. Um, one, just the fact that uh, the World Surf League uh, has brought the women to equal pay. And with that, we surf equal conditions, which, you know, as you pointed before, big and scary waves, powerful. Um, with the element of being in nature, there's sharks. And so there's going to be a glimpse into a, a shark attack that ultimately led us to pipe earlier than um, possibly we were thinking. And that is something that we have to consider, but it's also a part of nature mm -hmm. and we take that chance to do what we love. So um, there's a, incredible heroics. Uh, there's us getting past really big hurdles and just um, committing to what we love and what we do. And that's chasing after a world title. And you get to see all of that on this series, which has never, never been seen. So, mm, so cool. You make it sound and look easy, which is just so incredible. <laughs> Sage Erickson, thank you for joining us. We're so excited about this. It's a seven part documentary series called Make or Break Again. It's already been picked up for a second season. And right now, season one is available for streaming only on Apple TV plus. Thanks again, Sage. Country music legend Dolly Parton says she's honored to learn she's going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She told Billboard that when she initially asked about out of consideration, she didn't mean to cause trouble or stir up any controversy. Now she says, I guess I'm a rock star. <laughs> Dolly Parton, the queen of country, will take her seat among rock royalty with her induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2022. Parton posted on social media, I am honored and humbled by the fact that I have been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Of course, I will accept it gracefully. It comes after a two-month back and forth between the self-described backwoods Barbie and the organization. 
Martin, whose hits include Joe Lee, I Will Always Love You, and Nine to Five, originally said she would respectfully bow out of the process, adding that she felt she had not earned that right. But the Hall of Fame sent out its 1,200 ballots days before Dolly said she wanted to drop out. And last week, Parton changed her previous stance, telling NPR she would accept if chosen. I would yeah. just say thanks and I'll accept it. But when I said that, it was always my belief that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was for the people in rock music. And I have found out lately that it's not necessarily that. She told Billboard Wednesday that when people have called her a rock star, I thought they just meant that I was cool. But now I'm going to have to take it literally. This is not the first time Parton has turned down a major honor. Parton revealed to Hoda and Jenna she declined the Presidential <laughs> well, Medal actually, of Freedom not have, once, actually, but twice. I don't work for those awards. It'd be nice, but I'm not sure that I, you know... Uh, that I even deserve it. Now the country music legend is punching her ticket to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, adding to a long list of achievements during her remarkable career. Dolly says she doesn't yet know if she's going to the induction ceremony, but if she does, she told Billboard she's going to sing the hardest rock and roll style song she can muster <laughs> to prove she can do it. And yeah, she still also wants to produce a rock album. I right, hope that, we see her there. I know. That is it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.